Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang, live in San Francisco. Markets rebounding today on hopes of a possible vaccine candidate that looks promising and tens of thousands of rapid response coronavirus testing kits about to hit the market. President Trump, however, extending social distancing guidelines for at least another month. This has helped health experts around him paint a very dire picture of what's ahead. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the coronavirus could claim 100,000 to 200,000 American lives. We're going to take you live to that press conference at the Rose Garden where we're expecting President Trump to speak the daily coronavirus briefing. Meantime, I want to take a dive on what happened in the markets today and bring in our Wedge Miss co-host, Romaine Bostic. Romaine, walk us through the upward moves today. Yeah, so one thing that we are seeing here is this idea that the market is really trying to front run any potential rebound and recovery, not only in the economics uh, of our society, but also, of course, with regards to the health issues. The market's looking forward, and you saw that priced into the market over those three days on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of last week. That rally resuming today, the fourth update we've had over the past five days. What, what were the leaders today? It was primarily a lot of the healthcare names. A lot of the medical supply companies like Cardinal Health and McKesson helped to push this market higher, as did a lot of the consumer staples names like McCormick's, that's a spice maker, or names like P&G, also moving higher as well. But you also had this interesting story unfolding in the tech space, this idea here that a lot of these large cap tech names basically offer more of that sort of a yield play that you're not necessarily going to get uh, out of the traditional yield uh, drivers of this market, primarily the bond market. When you have 10-year yields that are continue to hover below 1%, and you have earnings yields and dividend yields on the on these large cap uh, tech names that are several percentage points above that, you throw in the fact that a lot of them have a pretty large and pretty well balanced balance sheets, cash sheets, I should say, uh, you start to get this type of optimism of uh, feeding into those names. So it's Microsoft up 7% on the day. It's, of course, uh, names like Facebook, Amazon, and Alphabet. It's also some of those second tier companies, Emily. You have Autodesk on a day like today rising 10%. You also had a lot of these other software as a services names and a lot of companies that sort of supply a lot of the guts, the nuts and bolts uh, of our data infrastructure, of our internet infrastructure, those names moving higher as a lot of investors, Emily, are now starting to anticipate that once we do get that economic recovery, there is going to be a structural shift in how people like you and me do business and how consumers uh, do their business as well. And it's going to benefit a certain cadre of companies. And those are the companies that moved higher today. All right, Romaine, hang on. I want to bring in uh, Jonathan Hurdle now, executive chair at Hurdle Callahan. Um, Jonathan, you're managing 20 plus billion dollars here. What is your sort of operating assumption right now in terms of just how long and deep this recession will be? That's a great question. Now, we know that there's going to be high ground on the other side of this valley. We don't know how deep it is or how wide it is. We were speaking to some of our managers in China last week, asking about their experience, but they've been out of lockdown faster than we have and harder. That's just the nature of their society. So our crossing of this recession valley may be different than theirs, but it is something to guide us. So we're not looking at a time so much as we are at depth and price. So we have a notion that where, where we would be natural buyers and where we would be trimming stocks. So you heard Romain talk about big tech there, Microsoft shares way up, Apple up, Facebook up, even Amazon up, despite some of the struggles that they're having, Jonathan. What's your view on big tech in particular? Does it stand out from the rest? Well, there's no question that at low interest rate environment, I mean, we're chief investment officers, so we're looking at long-term returns. And Romain mentioned the idea that interest rates, the 10-year treasury is about 0.7%. Uh, so the alternative is very low, and that discounts those future earnings dramatically. So it's when interest rates are low, those future earnings are worth more. So that helps growth stocks. At the same time, there is no investment in the world. There's no asset in the world that's not a good investment at some price, and there's no asset that's not, that is a good investment at any price. So clearly, growth stocks have an advantage in a low interest rate environment. Clearly, technology is part of this global story that is still intact globalization fueled by unprecedented transformational communication and a technological revolution around the world. So that long-term growth story is still intact, but we've got to be careful about price. And we're in this range right now that seems to be between maybe 2,200 and 2,800 on the S&P 500. And so we're thinking about when we get to higher levels like this, what might go wrong? As a chief investment officer, you're really trying to keep people between the extremes 
of euphoria and despair in that constructive area where rational mm -hmm. decisions are made. Right now, what we're really trying to do is use this fluctuation in the market to reposition the portfolio for the next decade. So, Jonathan, when you're trying to sort of make that reposition here, I mean, a lot of the normal things that we rely on, the valuation multiples, the correlations, mean reversions, all the things uh, that we learn uh, going through uh, our education with regards to learning this market, those things don't necessarily apply, at least not in this moment. So I'm just wondering, how do you then put a price on something? If you are looking for opportunities, you think something's cheap, how can you be sure? Or how can you have any sort of uh, comfort in the idea that the price you're putting on this is actually a fair value? Well, there is no such thing as sure. You cannot be certain. You have a, a sense where fair value is. And you want to, if, if it's around fair value, you want to accumulate positions. And if it goes lower, you accumulate more. That implies you have conviction in the fundamental value of what you're owning. And so this is a time, for example, I think, for, to be looking at individual names. Some of the names that Emily mentioned are stocks that people have wanted to buy for a long time, but generally have felt to be too expensive. So this is a time when people want to step up and own individual names or hire specific uh, active managers who have demonstrated skill. We like ones that are concentrated, not very index-like. So that we're shifting money away, not necessarily shifting the growth, the uh, stock bond balance in a portfolio, but putting more of that stock money into stock pickers and individual names that we feel strongly about. So there is no certainty on valuation. The biggest issue has been and remains this very low interest rate. Interesting on the individual names recommendation there. Jonathan Hurdle of uh, Hurdle Callahan and our own Maureen Bostic. Thank you both. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk to someone who's working Thank closely you. with customers, consumers, and merchants as they navigate these financial struggles brought on by the coronavirus pandemic. That is Max Levchin, the CEO of Affirm and the co-founder of PayPal. We'll speak to Max next. Also, we'll take you to the Rose Garden where President Trump is expected to speak any moment now. Uh, we will take you there as soon as that begins. This is Bloomberg. coronavirus pandemic has created a seriously distressed credit market here in the United States, leading consumers struggling to navigate their finances during that time. Uh, Affirm is a company that works with customers to allow them to pay for certain items, mostly discretionary items, in fixed monthly installments. I'm bringing in now uh, the co-founder and CEO of Affirm, Max Levchin, for an exclusive interview. Max, always good to have you with us. And of course, also the founder of, co-founder of PayPal. Um, so, Max, first of all, look, nobody knows how this is going to play out, just how long uh, this is going to last. But you, as a CEO, have to be making your models and have to be making certain assumptions about what the economy is going to look like three, six months from now. What is your sort of operating assumption um, in terms of how long this lasts, lasts and how long it gets um, for the tech economy and the economy at large? I think... You're totally right. It is way too early to make any sort of pronouncements. And anyone that's always the other is uh, just trying to make things up as they go along, just like I am. That said, it's important to prepare. My assumption, or our operating assumption, has been that there'll be a fairly severe shock in a very short term, as literally millions of people suddenly find themselves furloughed or unemployed and, and, and things like that. And so that's what you have to be prepared for. Now, the flip side is that prior to the crisis, the economy was generally thriving. The state of employment was extremely, extremely fully employed, and the banks and other forms of capital sources were very well capitalized ever since the early crisis. And so, in general, the state of the country is healthy. We're experiencing a literally grinding of the halt. But my current operating theory is that. As we get control of the virus and figure out how to operate in the new normal, the recovery will be relatively swift. That said, I think it's important to prepare for the eventuality that the damage the virus shut down does to us is so significant that it takes longer to restart. But bottom line is, I think it's going to hurt for a while in the beginning, and as we recover, it's probably going to recover reasonably fast. 
Now, President Trump extended social distancing guidelines until at least the end of April. We spoke to Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield last week. He said it could be as many as six months before employees, his employees, go back to work in the office full time. I mean, how long do you think your employees will be out of the office for and what are you preparing for? You know, we've been very, very lucky in a sense that it, it, just to give you a sense, it's very, very difficult for a highly, highly regulated company like Earn to go into work from home mode. And uh, my team, both our IT and operations teams, just stepped up and moved mountains to allow a large four office, multi office company go from you know, very comfortable distance in our multi city offices into entirely working from home. At this point, we're very prepared to stay in this mode modulo the social difficulty. It's lonely to uh, work out of your uh, spare bedroom. But that said, I think we're prepared to go as long as it takes. And uh, I'm certainly a big believer in the social distancing as a way of flattening the curve. So in that sense, if we must stay at home longer, so we will, just to make sure that fewer people die and fewer people have to go into the hospitals. And so in that sense, I think, uh, we're, we're quite prepared. Max, I want to talk to you a little bit about how the president has handled this crisis, because as of yesterday, he was looking at Easter as a sort of optimistic reopening of the economy date. Uh, then he extended it to the end of the month. I'm curious how that impacts you as a CEO when you're trying to make the decisions and, and forecast out just long your workforce is going to have to be working from home, um, how the president's sort of mixed messaging impacts how you run the company. You know, fundamentally, we have to read all the different signals concurrently. Um, probably the single most important authority government officials that are governing my San Francisco office are California state officials, Governor Newsom, all the folks in California that set our local policy. I think that's, and same, same thing goes for our offices in New York and Pittsburgh and Chicago and Salt Lake City. And so I think that's the, you know, beginning and the end of it. Each state has a different situation, and as we know, New York is extremely, extremely complex right now. California seems like it's doing a little bit better, et cetera. Uh, my guess is that the president has to balance his optimism and desire for quick return to work with the uh, realism of all of his advisors and the reality of the situation. So my guess is these dates will get revised and revised and hopefully move in the right direction. That's kind of what matters. We have to be prepared to do our work from home for as long as it takes. The most important thing, the, the, the worst mistake we can possibly make is to say, oh, we, surely we're gonna be back in our offices by date X and therefore this or that can be postponed or not get done. We're certainly not doing anything of the sort. We're assuming that we're going to be prepared for the worst. We're going to be prepared for the worst and we're certainly hoping for the best like everyone else. Now, a firm offers financing alternatives to credit cards and you have an interesting view on just how consumers are behaving right now, how this is all impacting merchants. What sort of trends are you seeing? Are you seeing people uh, missing payments? Are you seeing less spending in general, especially on discretionary items as folks uh, have their hours cut, lose their jobs, and are generally facing this tremendous uncertainty going forward? Uh, it, it's fascinating. Um, certainly not for the faint of heart, but to somebody who manages a financial services company, especially one that deals with risk every day, this is a fascinating time to, to do work, although terrifying time as well for, for all the obvious reasons. We're seeing all kinds of really interesting changes. It's a little bit too early to tell what's going to happen with delinquencies and defaults and payments. We are seeing significant amount of interest from consumers about hey, what will happen to my bills? What if I'm late? And the message that we have the privilege and, and the pleasure to deliver is, a firm has never charged late fees, never in our history, the billions of dollars lent, we've never collected a penny of fees of any kind and, and no late fees either. And so our consumers are protected. If they chose to use a firm to purchase things, they can be sure that we will work with them to, to make sure that they are able to uh, make their, as much as we can help them, we will, we will help them meet their obligations. Um, in terms of consumer trends, spending trends, all sorts of really fascinating things are happening. Um, as you might predict, uh, overall consumer spending, we are seeing it slow down. Things like fashion, things like you know, truly discretionary purchases are sharply down. Travel is in pain, to, to put it bluntly. 
On the flip side, things that make your home office better, things that make you more productive, things that make you feel like you're not trapped inside your apartment or inside your house are on the upswing. People are buying things that help you stay fit, things that help you work standing up, bigger monitors, you name it. There's all sorts of demand for those things. And they're surging to the point where they're significantly faster growing, the demand is growing faster than anything we've seen or expected. Uh, there's also a fair amount of general merchandise that people are buying. I think part of it is hoarding, unfortunately. Part of it is just being ready for further lockdowns or lockdowns that haven't hit them yet. But there's all sorts of movement, both in up and downward directions from the consumer demand. So how do you then plan to adapt and adjust a firm and the policies that you have as this progresses, again, not knowing what the end looks like with no end in sight? I think our mission is simple. We try to make sure that we are there to help our consumers and our merchant partners do business. When folks choose to use us to buy whatever it is going to help them stay sane or productive during their work from home period, we need to make sure they know we're reliable, we're there. Uh, we won't charge them late fees. We will work with them to make sure that uh, they have the personal solution that comes to expect. We're there to help our merchants sell the things that they want to sell that there's demand for during, during this downturn. We have to be thoughtful and uh, make sure that we understand how the job losses and how all the changes the economy is going to see in the short and long term will impact our consumers' ability to pay. But we also know that right now is when credit is most necessary. That's when people are starting to budget and try to figure out what can they stretch. Every dollar needs to go longer, and that's what the function of a company like a firm is. And so we are responsive every single day to everything from the uh, Federal Reserve announcements to uh, our merchants putting things on sale that they know they're trying to help people uh, get. Um, the advantage that we have is our ability to respond to data that we see in real time. One of the uh, one of the premises right. of companies like a firm is our ability to say, huh, things are changing. The stimulus that was just announced is an entirely new sort of X factor that I think everybody expected, but no one knows exactly what it's going to do. Our our job is to monitor the numbers and, and adapt to it. Now, Max, you and your former PayPal colleagues have always inspired great fascination. Elon Musk has been uh, very out front with, with his thoughts on the coronavirus, initially saying that the panic was dumb and, and, and that children are immune, which is actually, in fact, not true. That said, he has also um, vowed to uh, work on make making ventilators uh, to help. And I'm curious what your take is on his sort of initial uh, skepticism, at least, given this whole idea uh, that Silicon Valley often thinks it can do better than everyone else um, when it comes to finding solutions. You know, I think um, everyone who has made fun of this thing as uh, just a, a tougher flu or a uh, you know, silly problem is going to go away with the first rain of sunshine is probably slightly embarrassed by those comments, uh, and that excludes no one. Um, I think it's just a great illustration how it is really, really hard for human beings to understand exponential growth. Like, even if you've been in Silicon Valley your entire life and you watched viral spread of the uh, social media kind grow from nothing to everything, it is still just incredibly difficult to internalize this idea that yesterday we saw one or two infections, today we're seeing hundreds and expect more and it's just staggeringly difficult to imagine that that speed of growth that said i think on the negative side you have a bunch of people that say you know i'm, I'm no doctor or epidemiologist but step aside i'm smart i can do better i think that's hubris and probably mostly unjustified especially unjustified in situations like this virus on the other hand you do have this spirit of silicon valley and it extends beyond the physical silicon valley where when given direction or when given a good idea we know how to mobilize and inspire and just go through walls and build things. And so in that sense, I think if Elon is committing to build ventilators, by God, he's going to build a lot of ventilators and they're probably going to be quite good and he's going to go through walls to make sure this happens. So in that sense, I, I think that that's a wonderful uh, thing that uh, not, not just Elon, but all the industry now stepping behind these uh, these efforts to, to support the country. I, I think that that's just a good thing at all. Right. And, and Ford now joining in saying they're going to make 50,000 ventilators. Max Levchin, CEO of Affirm, co-founder of PayPal. Always great to have you here on the show. Max, thanks for sticking with us through that press conference and sharing your thoughts as well. 
Coming up, we're going to be talking about Amazon and Instacart workers taking to the streets, demanding better conditions, pay throughout this coronavirus outbreak, even if they decide to self-isolate. We're going to be talking to an Amazon warehouse worker coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. President Trump still speaking right now at the Rose Garden, giving an update on the latest state of the pandemic here in the United States, saying that one million people in the United States have been tested thus far. Uh, we're continuing to listen in to that press conference and we'll bring you any headlines as we have them. Meantime, in New York, about 100 Amazon workers staged a protest outside their Staten Island Fulfillment Center today. These workers complaining about unsafe conditions and saying that management has been unresponsive to their concerns. I want to bring in one of those workers now, Chris Smalls, an assistant manager at the Staten Island facility, as well as our own Josh Idelson, who covers workers' issues for Bloomberg. Um, both of you, thank you so much for joining us. Chris, I want to start with you. Uh, Amazon has confirmed that one employee at this facility has tested positive. You have told us there are more cases. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the conditions that you've been working in, that your colleagues have been working in, and why you feel they are unsafe. Um, well, the company has been uh, being false with the public and the media from day one. Um, they are, the conditions there are horrific. There's the items that we use uh, to clean up the buildings are scarce. Um, you got to think. If the, the medical field don't have PPE to protect the doctors and nurses, the first responders, what makes you think the retail company do? We don't have these things. We don't have the proper masks. We don't have the, the latex gloves. Um, yeah, they have a third-party cleaning crew, but even they are, they're scared. They're human beings. They're scared as well. So a lot of them haven't been showing up to work, you know, um, and it's just, it's all false. It's all sugar-coated. It is not true. It's untrue. Um, we have plenty of workers that haven't been to work for the entire month of March because they're scared, of, they're scared for their lives. You know, a lot of them was out there protesting with me today. Um, we have people that have lupus. We have people that have asthma. We have people that have infants at home. We have people that's pregnant. These are people that are being unpaid right now, and myself included. You know, I... I care about my, my twins, my seven-year-old twins I have at home, and I don't want to bring anything back home um, to them. So, you know, I, I haven't seen them in over a month and a half, and it's because I'm scared of, of going to work. And these are the, you know, the scrutiny that we have. You know, we need uh, money to pay bills, you know, and the company dropped the ball on this one. They're not treating their people right, and I had to take action, and unfortunately, Taking action, it cost me my job, you know, um, breaking news. I'm um, just letting you guys know. The company just called me and terminated me, you know, and I felt like I was a target. And it's okay. I'm still going to be the voice of the people. I'm still going to continue to fight for those people inside that building. And, um, you so know, shame on Amazon. Hang on, Chris. You're saying Amazon just fired you? I am confirming that, yes. They just called me over the phone and they terminated me. Uh, claiming that I violated a quarantine, which is ridiculous. It's insane and it's in inhumane what they're doing. They're trying to silence me. You know, I was always a target, and it's fine. You know, I predicted this would happen, and unfortunately it happened sooner than later. But at the same time, you know, I feel like people know I'm doing the right thing. I got plenty of people that's uh, supporting me, you know, their own people that's inside the building that's still supporting me. I'm going to continue to fight. You know, it's not going to stop me. Um, you know, Amazon and Jeff Bezos, they can keep this company. Um, they can keep their money. If they don't know how to treat people right, I don't want to work for them. So, you know, I have no problem parting ways with the company. I've been there five years. I've always been a dedicated worker. I've been a hard worker. Everybody knows me. Everybody loves me. You know, and because I tried to stand up for something that's right, you know, the company decided to retaliate against me today and they terminated me. So shame on Amazon. Now, Chris. Um, and that's it, you know. We, we actually 
We reached out to Amazon um, for a statement on, on some of the claims that you've made. Um, mm -hmm. They said, we have taken extreme measures to keep people safe. This is what Amazon is saying, tripling down on deep cleaning, procuring safety supplies that are available, changing processes to ensure those in our building are keeping right. safe distances. Now, they also addressed you and some of your comments in particular, and I want you to be able to respond to this. They said, sure. we've heard a number of incorrect comments from Christian Smalls. He is, in fact, on a 14-day self-quarantine requested by Amazon to stay home with full pay. He was placed in paid quarantine out of an abundance of caution because we notified him that he may have had close contact with someone at the building who was diagnosed. Um, oh, I'm going to let you respond to that because... So, so, so what is true in your view? They are lying through their teeth. Um, I've been in the building every, every day, in and out that building, until, up until Saturday, which is my last day at work, which I haven't been at work. I've been at the building physically, but I've been off the clock. I haven't been working. What I was doing, I took a stance on Tuesday. Thank God for me going to work on Tuesday and actually clocking in. When I clocked in on Tuesday morning, um, the, the second known, well, unknown case to the public, but second known case, confirmed case, my colleague, um, she looked sick. I sent her home. I was only around her for less than five minutes. She'd been around my entire department for 10 plus hours the entire week. You don't quarantine my, my, my people. You didn't, you didn't quarantine not one of them. You didn't even notify them. These are true facts. Didn't even notify them till this day. I gave her equipment to another supervisor. They ain't quarantine her either. I ride to work with a coworker. They didn't quarantine him. This was a strategic quarantine to silence me. I was in that building every single right. day this week. I spoke with HR directly. I I didn't sugarcoat it. I told them. I said, Hey, you guys know. Um, my colleague tested positive, and you know I was around her for about five minutes, but I'm just letting you guys know that she's been in direct contact right. with numerous numerous people that's working, and you guys um, need to close the building down and sanitize it. Um, and this is just a way of cutting off the head of the snake. You know, they didn't notify me. The HR rep told me that she will, they will be a, uh, they will call me over the phone. I don't even know when I got quarantined. Chris, when do you get quarantined? They don't even explain that. Is it from the day you get in contact? I, or is it from the day that they walk me out the door? Which one is it? They haven't even told me. I, I understand, so. Chris. This is this is probably a very terrifying situation for you, and I, I really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. I want to bring in Josh Adelson, who covers worker issues for Bloomberg. Obviously, Josh, you know we're we're seeing these uh, stories of of workers upset with with how the warehouse is handling Amazon warehouses handling them across the country. Local news reports, um, you know, sometimes conflicting uh, conflicting um, recount re recantations of events. Um, you know, sort of what's your take? on what's going on here at Staten Island and beyond. Well, what we're seeing is a wave of protests by workers who are deemed, whether by the government or by their employers, to be doing essential work while many of the rest of us are staying home, but who don't think they're getting the safety measures or the compensation that they deserve for it. And Amazon has now faced a situation at a number of warehouses where there have been reported cases. There's been agitation by workers from circulating petitions to the walkout that we saw today. The company, as the virus situation has intensified and as the pressure from workers and lawmakers and others have intensified, the company has added additional measures in response. But this is very serious scrutiny for Amazon to deal with. And we're in a situation right. now where workers who in the past might have been too concerned to take a risk of collective action, now perceive a risk in coming to work that really changes how they make that decision and opens people up to the possibility Josh. of acting together. Well, well, we'll have to leave it there. We're running into a hard break. Josh Adelson for Bloomberg. Chris Smalls, uh, an Amazon worker, thank you for sharing your story with us. Uh, stay close to Bloomberg. Uh, we'll be right back.